The best way to really get to the bottom of an issue is to get your own personal experts assembled. And that's, you know, sometimes people call that ladies who lunch. Sometimes mm -hmm. that calls it like the dream team. Or if you want the world's problems solved, just take another like kind of middle-aged mom, young mom, old mom, it doesn't matter, and go on a power walk and you'll solve all the problems. A walk and talk. Yeah, a yeah. walk and talk. <laughs> Welcome to The Lisa Show, where we take a good look at life. Welcome to the Council of Moms. Today I have Carrie Ann Rhodes and Vanessa Quigley. And so we're going to dive into the council with kind of a look back through time in how it can help us today. And what I mean is, is generationally, self-care has changed a lot, right? And and before we look at our mothers, grandmothers, children, and, and everyone in between, I want to start with you guys. How has self-care changed for you over the years? Wow. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> I was yeah. still trying to get yeah. my college degree when I had my first baby. And so I was immediately thrown into the fire of juggling school, a child, a husband. And uh, what was, what did I want? I didn't even know at that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's when it came to a head for you. Yes. You didn't know you got self-care. Right. You like, were, that, you, that was part of, you were entitled to self-care. <laughs> exactly. And no, because no one talked about it. I yeah. mean, my mom never talked about it. I didn't really see her doing it. Although now, like through the lens of being an experienced mother now with seven yes. children of my own, my oldest is 27, um, I can see how she was coping, like the things that she was doing. It wasn't under the cloak of self-care, but she was an artist, an artist at heart, and the mother of 12 kids. Oh, oh my wow. goodness. So Holy while cow. mothering these 12 kids and overseeing the small farm that we had in the backyard, my dad liked to collect animals, and we had like basically one of every farm animal that you can imagine, um, she would retreat into her world of art always, you know, painting or drawing or basket weaving. Do you remember the basket making phase? Oh, yeah. That was a thing in the 80s. Yeah, that was a thing in <laughs> the there 80s. Were, there were lots of baskets yes. in the 80s. And toll painting. Yes. And oh, yeah, I remember that. She was an incredible seamstress. And my mother had an uncanny ability to just shut out the world around her, all the chaos, all the craziness, and just retreat into art. And um, what a blessing that was for her. But I didn't realize at the time that that's what she was doing. Oh, interesting. Um, but, you know, later on when I found myself in similar shoes, I could see, oh, yes, yeah, self-care. So what's your basket weaving? <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I love music so much. I love to sing and I love theater. And I started working full-time a few years ago and— that used to be how I kept myself happy and healthy. But it's been really hard now that I'm a working mom to juggle that. But I love going to the theater. I love listening to music. My kids play music and write music. And so it's just around me all the time. And I just love losing myself in music. Oh, that's so great. When did you start sort of saying, this is self-care? Like putting the label on it. I think when my fifth baby was born, and I— That's I, the one that broke you. No, I'm just <laughs> no, literally. <laughs> that's when cracked. the crying started. That could not oh, stop. No. I was doing what I wanted to do more than anything, and that was be a mother. Um, actually, that is a little tiny lie, because what I really wanted to be was an opera singer on the stage, touring the world. Really? And that's what I was studying to, to, you know, to become when I found out I was pregnant with my first baby. So then that was like a— okay, time to pivot. I'm going to do the mom thing now. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it good and fast and hard. And I had babies basically every 18 to 24 months. Um, but then baby five came along. And I remember distinctly hearing a, a song, an aria came on. And it used to fill my soul with just peace and happiness and joy. And instead, it brought on the tears. And I just kept crying and crying and crying because I realized I've sacrificed this important part of myself on the altar of motherhood. This motherhood that I love and I'm getting so much satisfaction out, but I'm I'm missing part of me. And my husband recognized what was happening. And there wasn't an opera company where we were living in suburban Massachusetts at the time, but he found a little theater company and he sent me the information and I went and, and auditioned for Evita. Oh, wow. And I got cast as the mistress and as one of the dancers in the oh, ensemble. Oh my goodness, that's and a dream. I came back to life. 
oh, singing wow. and dancing and pre- pretending I'm some other person <laughs> so af- far apart from my real life, um, it saved me. And so wow. that was just a reminder that I need to tend to this part of myself. Wow. Okay, what has your journey been like with <laughs> discovery of self? Well, I'm I'm happy to know that maybe we found another karaoke, a karaoke partner here know, in Vanessa. Ooh, because so. this is, is Carrie Ann's, yeah, love. Like karaoke. first love is karaoke. Let's She's always trying it. to get karaoke. people to do it. Yeah. But it's true. That's self-care, though. When Have you done that your whole life? No, no. And in fact, talk about a progression of um, self-care. It's reflected on the sophistication of our karaoke setup. Um, So back in the day, it was just like this machine that had CDs that you'd put in and sing on a tiny screen. And now I have like the professional setup. Like it's on my iPad, any song in the world, you know, plays on my TV with cordless microphones. So yeah, it is the cheapest therapy out there. (laughs) What so. do you think it does for you? Oh, it's such a release of emotion, I guess. I don't know. I I'm I guess I'm, I'm an emotional person, but I don't like to show negative negative emotions like I hate crying. I really don't like being upset. Like I'm pretty positive, but sometimes you're just feeling those feels. You have a conversation that's not gone well or you know, you've got pressures of family life or whatever kind of happening that are taking up RAM in your brain. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not at the forefront, but it's kind of in the background. And so I found things like just singing karaoke really loud in my house. It is just this beautiful release of like feeling and emotion and physically like you're drained after and you you're, you can't talk, your voice is hoarse and you know, and I feel so much better. I am not a karaoke expert. I really feel a little self-conscious at karaoke. I was just going to ask oh. you, when do you perform in front of people? Like I think I could really <laughs> get into it alone I think in my you basement could without really, really get into it. Well, see, it. I'm yes. trained in a classical vocal I know. style, so whenever I sing along to Taylor Swift on the radio, my kids all like will make fun of me endlessly. <laughs> They're like, "Mom!" Even the other day, my daughter Lakin was performing, and I was videotaping her, yeah. and I was kind of singing along. And afterwards, she was like playing that clip over and over again because it's me singing. I just want to be. I just want to be bored. <laughs> Along to her, like, pop-styled indie songwriter. And I'm like, okay, I'm so embarrassed. I might but you got to get it out. Oh, you got to get great. it out. It felt good in the moment. Okay? And she'll never forget it. <laughs> You're teaching her the basics of self-care, right? Oh. What do you think your kids' perspective— you guys have kids of many, many different ages. I think we've got all the ages covered. What is, if you asked them— What's self-care or what do you do for self-care? How do you think that they would respond or how have you observed them doing self-care? For themselves? Yeah. Yoga. I think my girls really, and yoga can be so restorative. Um, It's also hard to do if you feel like you need to go to a class and you need to be on someone's schedule. I I find it personally hard to practice yoga on my own. I I need someone to follow and to to set the rhythm Mm -hmm. and everything. A little bit of competition or like... Not competition, but no, like a social context. Yes. Yeah, and just model it for me. Like, I don't yes. know if I'm doing that right. Um, but when I hear my kids and my teenagers and my young adult children talk about self-care, it often has to do with taking care of their physical body, exercise, running, eating healthy. Um, and those are definitely parts of it. But especially in the context of running, I, I will say there was a time where I thought, well, I need to run because everyone says running is so good for your brain and it's good for your body and everything. Running hurts me. <laughs> like it really hurts my legs. And I tried it. I did it. I did a Ragnar even, um, but oh it was goodness. not sustainable for me. And I was having all kinds of physical problems. So like what someone's self-care might be for them and might work for them, it's not like a one-size-fits-all no. solution. No. But I think that when, especially younger people, when they talk about self-care, it seems to be more like physical, like a spa treatment or to go to a, you know, a meditation retreat. I don't know. What, what do you think? What, what comes to your mind? I think that's that? definitely part of it. And, and I think for us, maybe in our generation of kind of growing up talking about self-care, that's what we thought it was. We thought it was like manicures and massages and things like that, which it absolutely can be, Mm -hmm. but it's sometimes just the time alone. It's not necessarily what you're doing or like the beautification process. It's simply that like 
you're relaxing for a minute with your hands on a table, you know, you might be chatting, you might not. Like, that's what the self-care is. It's not necessarily kind of what you do. It's interesting, my kids, without my without my influence, my 10-year-old boy, he will sometimes just, like, stand up and be like, I just got to go run around the block. And he will, (laughs) and he will just, he just kind of knows, like he gets antsy. And so he'll, he'll put on his running shoes and he'll go, you know, run around the block. And for my daughter, she loves to lose herself in craft. She calls it crafting. And she's got this little table and, you know, bits and pieces of cardboard and, and shapes and glitter things and lots of glue. And she makes the most amazing things. And I, I think we've talked before the idea of flow, where um, professionals, kind of in any given field, when you're really kind of tuned into what you're doing and you feel like that inspiration is coming and time kind of flies by, mm-hmm. um, that can be a type of self-care for me. And me I too. And I see that in my daughter, too. That's what's happening to her when she's sitting down at her little craft table is she's in, she is receiving that flow and, you know— she can do it for hours, and it, and it restores her. Like if she's feeling kind of stressed or bored, it yeah. leads her to that kind of activity, which is good. I, a child telling me they're bored is really it means tough. you're winning. No, you actually you we want our kids to be bored, even yeah. though it can be yes. brutal. But that means that they're heading in the right direction to allow themselves to unplug, yes, and breathe and like have thoughts of their own. As you were talking, it made me think about one of the things that I've seen my older girls especially do. I think in the name of self care is take Instagram off their phone. Oh, you know, yeah! Instagram like, was take not a, break. a part of our world. Mm-hmm. Social media was not a part of our world when we were growing up. Um, and I even have to like make a concerned effort to manage the influence it's going to have in my life and the hold it has on me. Um, but my girls will often just delete it from their phone for a period of time. And I think in the name of self care because mm-hmm. too much of it is not good for any of us. And I think these younger people have a much harder time regulating that. For so for them, it's just like, well, just delete it. That's Take really it hard. I, I talk admire to my kids that too about like just be care, be really, really careful about who you follow. I actually got this idea from one of my sons because I said, "Oh, you know, you seem unbothered by social media," and he's like, "Oh yeah, that's because I I hardly follow anyone, and the only accounts that I follow are you know this criteria or whatever that just like are funny or make me feel good or are informative or just based on my interest, and they're not this sort of like competitive aspirational content mm-hmm. that I think that yeah, yeah. and so." I am impressed that our kids already have picked up on that, you know? Yeah, and they they can step away on their own. Yeah. One of my uh, daughters is really good about saying, you know, coming home from school or from being with friends or whatever and saying, I need to be alone for a minute and to recharge. And I would have never been that self-aware at her age to know when I, you know, oh, I just need to recharge. (laughs) Do you you think it's—I mean, is that because— is that is this idea of self care maybe just kind of more part of our? I think pop so. Psychology. Yeah, I do. I think and our like our social interactions and like my kids know about being an introvert and an extrovert mm-hmm. and what fills you up and what drains you and mental health and you know and especially like in our home we've been really open about mental health um, because my kids have had to deal with grief in huge ways and so. Um, listening to like how they feel and that kind of stuff. And it's funny because we have like sort of code words for each other of like when I need to go walk the dog, you know, (laughs) with one of my kids and I know what that means. Mm -hmm. Like I need to, I don't want to talk. I want to tell you how I'm feeling because that's what I want to (laughs) do. That's what mom wants to do. But, and that's my cue of, I know what my needs are and and I'm going to take care of it. And, and I have another kid who likes to just go, even though they're older and I thought I would get rid of my trampoline by now. I thought it was such like a little (laughs) kid thing. Uh, you know, a couple of my kids regularly will go out and jump on the trampoline. And I think just the kind of like flying through the air and just that motion and that they and being outside mm-hmm. and the sort of rhythm of it is like they're running around the block or getting, you know, that sort of angst out. Yep. And it's so interesting to me that they know when that's necessary and they just do it. You totally sparked a memory. As a teenager, there was a park in uh, my town in Massachusetts that whenever I was stressed or overwhelmed or even with friends, like having fun, we would always go to this park. And the swings were amazing. And we had this obstacle course that we would do. And it was, maybe it's this kind of idea of of something physical kind of combined with something freeing Mm -hmm. and maybe in the realm of play. I, I, I... I used to be really good at playing and I've and I've noticed that as an adult, 
as, as I get older and like creakier, I'm less likely to do those kind of play things. And, and I think we know how beneficial play is for kids, but still for teenagers and adults. And I really utilize that younger, but somehow I've lost that as an as adult. I need to get that back. But well, you know what? It is more socially acceptable for adults to play now. I mean, I don't think that like it was necessarily for our parents and grandparents. Oh, no. No, can you my, imagine I your parents no on a memories. skateboard like, do of you my have... parents ever getting in the pool with yeah, us? Right? No. Um, not even in... You, I know you grew up in Florida. They never <laughs> no, had a pool with No, us. no. Well, like, one what? time that on a dare, shame. my dad did. On a dare. We bought him this ridiculous little red Speedo and it was disgusting. <laughs> anyway, um, but thinking about the trampoline, like I think my heart yearns for play and I walked by our trampoline the other day and I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do it. No. But this 50-year-old body <laughs> cannot do it. <laughs> my bones yeah. felt like they were breaking. My bladder was not doing its job. <laughs> um, but the swings is a brilliant idea. And when I was walking the dog the other night, because that is something that I like to yeah. do is just escape my house and all my people and go for a little walk in the cool evening, I saw, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, but an adult in the dark on the swings, swinging, really? swinging. And as I did, oh. I did three laps of the park that night, and they were just swinging hard. And I thought, <gasps> I am going to do that. That looks so fun. I swear it's therapy. Yes. Wouldn't it be so funny if you just got the swing right next to that person and just started swinging without saying anything? Don't talk. Like if you were 12, it would be nobody totally would think normal. anything. But like as an adult, it would especially at night, it'd be the creepiest <laughs> thing. Oh, but amazing. That's Vanessa, so you said something earlier that really resonated the the idea that your kids are on board with what is going on in the family. That and I think this is different than past generations where um, I vaguely knew when things were hard for my dad at work, but not like— Oh, yeah, you didn't know the details. I didn't know the details, yeah. really, not until not until much later, and I'm, like, staggered that the man didn't have a heart attack at, you know, 39. But um, the idea that, like, we're in this together, all the kids understand, like, this is, this is you know, parent work. This is what my parents are doing to, like, sustain my family, to, to make a living. I, I feel like we are more transparent with that, that we can be— this is what's happening. And even with my own kids, like when they when I pick them up from school, I lay down every day. They come home from school. I go to my bed. I lay down and I play a game on my phone. And that that for me is like a rest period in between what I've been doing all morning and like getting ready for dinner and mm-hmm. homework and everything that night. And I mean, my kids understand that like, Mommy hasn't been doing this all day. I haven't been laying in my bed playing on my phone all day. Like, this is, the, and I've explained, like, this is my time to rest because blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, they're not, Mom, you know, come do this. or They respect that time a little bit. And I get my break. And I'm also kind of helping them understand, like, Mom and Dad work hard during the day. And we, we need a break, too. Yeah. And I think that's And it's that's giving them okay. permission to be able to do it even mm-hmm. now or in the future. Like, I need to go in my room and be alone for a minute. Okay. Right. I yeah. saw my mom and, uh, and laying okay. on her bed reading a book. And that was her time, you know, to like be alone, to recharge kind of thing. And, and you're all doing it, helping each other together. Yeah. And we respected it. We understood what was happening. Like, not like, oh, mom's neglecting us. It was, oh, this is, mom, this is mom's time. So I think it's healthy that they understand this is the general plan and this is how we accomplish and this is how I'm going to take my break and this is how you can take your break. I think that's good, right? Yeah. Okay, so knowing that self-care, you know, changes over our lives and depending on our circumstances and I mean, certainly like economic, but also how many kids you have, what type of work you do, if you have, you know, what your partner's like, like all all of those things affect self-care. Do you anticipate like what in the next phase of your life self-care will will do? Do you ever fantasize about that? Like, because yes. you know it's going to change? Yeah. Yes. I'm constantly looking, not constantly looking, but I am, I am a a chronic learner. Like, I I would be in school for the rest of my life if I had my way. And so I'm always looking for a new class I can take or um, pursuing a skill or enhancing a skill that I have. And and I think I've probably mentioned before, I took up ceramics a year ago and have loved it and have kind of just like, it's, it's this whole new world to kind of delve into. And there's, you know, it's opened this you know, vast kind of opportunity to see new things and do new things and um, explore new people and new um, cultures. Like, how have different cultures expressed, um, you know, their their individuality through the pottery that they have made? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of an endless interest. And so, 
it's not going to be my last interest. And I don't have to like make money at this. This isn't something that I'm trying to, you know, be a potter and like sell my wares. But it's something that it's engaging. Um, it's good for my brain. It's good to, it's good. It's been a good way to find time to spend a little time outside of the house. And so that's got a good balance for me. It's a great metaphor for self-care of like, it's not about beating yourself up about if you're doing it right or wrong, right. but just like, oh, now I want to do this. And now, you know, and this serves me and, oh, I miss doing that. And and, and I've, I've felt that, that void. And so now I'm going to go back to it. Yeah. My sister, I was talking with my sister about the idea of self-care and kind of, oh, what have, what have you done? And she has um, more children than I do. And so I'm always interested in what their perspective. And she shared... Uh, She's been playing Bunko with friends for like 20 years. And I don't exactly know what Bunko is, but it's a type of game and you get together and they have um, a theme night and they have really delicious food and it's a really fun social thing and you play a game and there's there's prizes. And so she's been part of this group. And when her kids were young, she was picking up her daughter from preschool and and she said, oh, I have, I've got Bunko tonight. And the preschool teacher said, oh, I re- Bunko's fun. I remember when I used to play Bunko, but man, I'm glad those days are over now. And my sister was like, what? Like, this is my favorite thing that I do. This is what I look forward to each month. Like, am I ever, she questioned, am I ever going to get to the point where I don't love going to Bunko? Well, she hit that point last month. No. And she finally, you know, retired from her group. And she realized that even that one night that she really enjoyed being with her friends, having fun, having it be special and different. Her kids are an age now where she would so much rather sit and watch a true crime show with her daughter while she still has her at home. Or, you know, just, just kind of be there for these moments that she recognizes. She's only got a couple more years before these kids are gone. And she couldn't believe she got to the point where she could let that go. And so times and seasons. Yeah, I, for I sure. love it. Let, let, you're the boss of it. You get mm-hmm. to decide what you hang on to and what you let go. Well, and I've had that experience too where I used to, when I had a bunch of young children, I wanted to get out of the house and be with other people. But now that my kids are all older, they are my favorite people. Mm-hmm. I want to be with them. They don't, I don't know if they'd always choose me, but. <laughs> Puzzles, hear, yeah. jigsaw puzzles, is such, has been such a great way for me to connect with my older kids because, especially teenagers, it's hard to get them talking sometimes, or even just to sit down for a minute. Right, but no one in my family, at least, can resist a puzzle. So I <laughs> always have a puzzle on our table, and it's like gravity just pulls them in. And while we're puzzling and not, you know, having to make awkward eye contact, we've had some amazing conversations. And sometimes the OCD and some of us keep us there until that puzzle is done. Even if it's <laughs> two in the morning. It's self-care. It's self-care. <laughs> Leave me alone. That's my dream. Lisa, you've got the dream of the family band. Listen, I've got the dream my of kids the puzzle told table. me how many times it's never going to happen. Mom, stop. I I'm like, but what if I Vanessa? start playing it's this song on the piano? Don't you all want to sing? Nope, Come join no me in the backup sing. singers of our family band, Lisa. The Lisa Show is a production of BYU Radio. It's hosted by Lisa Valentine Clark and produced by McKay Menden and Becca Hurley with music and post-production by Sam Clausen. If you like the show, make sure to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you have questions for the Council of Moms, you can connect with us on Instagram and Facebook. Next week on The Lisa Show. And I just stayed maybe about 10 feet in front or so and every once in a while just kind of peek back and go in my head because I didn't want to say it out loud and (laughs) tick everybody off. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> Come on. And we did it. And we did it. I mean, to say a half marathon, that's no, yeah. significant. That's it felt like it. we like to say, that's not nothing. And and you feel it afterwards. So we did all cross the finish line holding hands. Yeah, it was so cheesy it was and so beautiful. So wonderful. I loved it. A light rain started falling. Mm-hmm. And then the city of Nashville <laughs> flooded. So we got out of there just in time. That's next week on the Lisa Show. Download it wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>